Hello. Today's lecture will address the behavioral objectives for week five in the syllabus. Let's begin. Alterations in the gastrointestinal function. Fluid and electrolyte. Newborn weight is approximately 75% water. This decreases to about 50 to 55% in adults. Newborns have more extracellular than intracellular fluid. The opposite is true for children and adults. Children under two years of age, their kidneys are immature, so they may become dehydrated and develop fluid and electrolyte imbalances more easily. The first problem we will discuss is dehydration. Isotonic dehydration is the most common type in children. Signs and symptoms. Mild signs and symptoms include weight loss. For an infant, that would be three to five percent. Weight loss for a child would be three to four percent of their weight. The pulse will be within normal limits, blood pressure within normal limits, behavior as well. Thirst, they'll be slightly more thirsty. Mucous membranes within normal limits. Tears are present. The anterior fontanelle is within normal limits. External jugular vein is visible when supine. The skin will have a skin turgor, which is not an immediate recoil. Specific gravity will be greater than 1.020. Moderate dehydration, weight loss. Infants will have a six to nine percent weight loss. Children will have six to eight percent. Pulse is slightly increased. Blood pressure possibly orthostatic greater than 10 millimeters of mercury change. Behavior, they be, may be more irritable. They may be more thirsty. The mucous membranes may be more dry. Tears will be decreased. Anterior fontanelle may be normal to sunken. The external jugular vein, not necessarily visible except with supracavicular pressure. The skin, uh, again, decreased turgor. Uh, this may, again, be uh, less useful in children greater than two. Urine-specific gravity, again, greater than 1.020 to oliguric. Severe dehydration. The weight loss in infants would be greater than or equal to 10%. Weight loss in children would be greater than 10%. Pulse is very increased. Blood pressure, orthostatic to shock. They may be hyper irritable to lethargic. Very, very thirsty. Membranes uh, may be parched. Tears may be absent. Remember that tears often are not present prior to two months of age. Anterior fontanelle will be sunken. The external jugular vein may not be visible even with supraclavicular pressure. Uh, they may have tenting. The skin may be cool. They may have acrocyanotic or mottled skin coloring. The specific gravity of the urine may be actually oligoric, which is very decreased urine. We typically expect a urine output of one milliliter per kilogram an hour or anuric. Capillary refill could be greater than three seconds. Medical treatment. Oral rehydration with Pedialyte, Infantilite, and Rehydrolyte. You can freeze the liquids to make it easier for the kids to take. This way it will mimic a popsicle and most children enjoy popsicles. To calculate the IV needs for maintenance and replacement fluids, you must first calculate the maintenance fluids. There is a box in your textbook that will tell you exactly how to calculate the maintenance fluids. In general, we say there is 100 milliliters per kilogram for the first 10 kilograms for 24 hours. For children that are over 10 kilograms, but less than 20 kilograms, we will get 1,000 milliliters plus 50 milliliters per kilogram after 10 kilograms. And then for children that are over 20 kilograms, in general, we would say you would give them 150 milliliters plus 
20 milliliters for every kilogram after 20 kilograms. Replacement fluids must also be given in addition to maintenance fluids when a person is dehydrated. Initial IV therapy for severe dehydration is typically 20 milliliters per kilogram over five to 20 minutes. Repeat based on the child's assessment. Then to replace deficits to catch up on losses, finally the child refer returns to oral foods and fluids, but they may still require IV therapy. For mild dehydration, often children will receive 50 milligrams per kilogram for rehydration, moderate dehydration, 100 milliliters per kilogram, and severe dehydration, 150 milliliters per kilogram. If the child has isotonic or hypotonic dehydration, give the first half of the replacement fluid over eight hours and the rest over 16 hours. If hypertonic dehydration is present, give the replacement fluid over a 48 hour time frame. Replacement fluid and maintenance fluid are given simultaneously. Hypotonic dehydration is typically a sodium less than 130. Isotonic is typically 130 to 150 sodium. Hypertonic, a sodium level of 150 or more. What do we need to do as a nurse? Critically, we need to monitor vital signs, intake and output, weight, Weight is very important because weight loss is the most reliable indicator for dehydration in kids. Other assessments include skin trigger, level of consciousness, postural hypotension, fontanelle assessment, capillary refill, lung assessment is very important during rehydration because we need to monitor the lung sounds for signs and symptoms of fluid overload. Remember, anytime you're giving a patient Fluids that contain potassium make sure adequate urine output is present. Instruct parents to seek medical attention if the child is vomiting and not tolerating oral rehydration after four hours. Do not give diet drinks. Sugar is necessary to facilitate the absorption of sodium. Also, do not give full strength sugary drinks or jello or juices because this can actually increase issues of diarrhea. Please dilute with water half and half. Diarrhea, you may also see this as referred to as acute gastroenteritis or abbreviated as AGE. This is the leading cause of illness in children less than five years of age. In the United States, children under five still die from diarrhea and dehydration. There are different types of diarrhea, acute, chronic, intractable in infancy, and then chronic, nonspecific uh, between the ages of six and 54 months. <coughs> Signs and symptoms. An increase in number and more liquid stool, cramping, irritable, hard to console. They may have nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. Remember, nausea is a symptom that the patient must be able to say they feel nauseous. Therefore, in a nonverbal patient, it, you are not able to write down that they are nauseous because they cannot tell you they are nauseous. Diagnosis. Get a thorough history from parents, including travel history and daycare. Check stool for ova and parasite, infections, C. diff if they've been recently on antibiotics, checking for viruses, Rotavirus is the most important cause of dehydrating diarrhea in the world and does require contact isolation. Many children now are vaccinated against rotavirus. This is a live virus vaccine. Also, please check a complete metabolic panel. It is best to prevent diarrhea with good hand hygiene. Be very careful when traveling, good hand washing, and making sure children have all of their vaccines. As mentioned a moment ago, children can get a rotavirus vaccine to prevent rotavirus. The number of doses depends on the actual type of vaccine. Please refer to your immunization schedule for the exact set schedule of when rotavirus should be administered. Treatment. 
very important to correct the fluid and electrolyte imbalance, as well as to correct the dehydration. If a child has severe dehydration and they are hospitalized, typically they will have an IV. They may actually be placed NPO for 12 to 48 hours to allow the bowel to rest. Remember that IV fluids with potassium chloride must be given only in the presence of adequate urine output. As a nurse, again, monitoring those vital signs frequently, checking the stool for the number, amount, color, odor, consistency, occult blood, ovum parasite, and rotavirus. Remember, diarrhea is counted as part of the output put because it is typically liquid. Contact isolation should occur for all cases of diarrhea until the cause is known. Assess daily weight and take an output. Again, you may limit solid foods to rest the bowel. Assess for signs and symptoms of dehydration as we've already discussed. Please change the diaper frequently. You wanna gently wash the bottom after each BM. Apply a and D, zinc or Vaseline as a barrier to prevent skin breakdown and leave the diaper open to air as appropriate. Once a child is rehydrated and clear liquids are tolerate, tolerated, infants often are given breast milk or formula. Toddlers can be given a soft pureed diet. Children can have an easy to digest regular diet. And typically you will slowly resume the normal diet that they eat. The brat diet should be avoided because of poor nutritional content. Some children will tolerate a regular diet once they are rehydrated. Hirschsprung's disease. This is a congenital aganglionic megacolon. The absence of the ganglion cells in one or more of the areas of the colon basically causes a decrease or absence in the propulsive movements and causes an increased accumulation of the intestinal contents and distension of the bowel proximal to the defect. In other words, without those ganglionic cells, the intestine does not move the stool through the intestine. Diagnosis. This is based on history, bowel pattern. Diagnosis is confirmed with a biopsy. Uh, and basically this biopsy, biopsy will show that there is a lack of ganglion cells. <clears throat> There's a table in your book that have the signs and symptoms, but I will state them here. So for a newborn, failure to pa pass meconium within 24 to 48 hours after birth, reluctance to ingest fluids, bile stained vomitus, abdominal distension. In infancy, failure to thrive, constipation, abdominal distension, episodes of diarrhea and vomiting, an ominous sign, which can be a sign of presence of enterocolitis, which is a leading cause of death, would be explosive watery diarrhea, fever, and severe prostration. Childhood, signs and symptoms you would see would be things like constipation, ribbon-like, foul-smelling stools, abdominal distension, visible peristalsis on the abdomen. Fecal masses may be easily palpated as well. Children usually are poorly nourished and anemic. Preoperatively, as a nurse, we would be checking the vital signs, fluid and electrolyte replacements, signs and symptoms of bowel perforation, such as fever, increasing in abdominal distension, an increase in abdominal circumference, vomiting, abdominal tenderness, irritability, shortness of breath, and cyanosis. Symptomatic treatment with isotonic enemas and a low fiber, high calorie, high protein diet, and in severe situations, the use of TPN. Use of isotonic enemas are necessary in children. If the patient has a mild defect, often dietary modifications, stool softeners, and isotonic colon irrigations will be effective to prevent impaction. If a child is having surgical removal of the aganglionic colon, 
a temporary colostomy and re-anastomosis will take place when the child is about 20 pounds. The temporary colostomy typically takes place very early on in the newborn period. Post-op, vital signs, intake and output, of course monitoring for hemorrhage, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, bowel sounds, checking for diarrhea, and a few days later, checking for infection. Parents need to be taught all aspects of ostomy care. Also, they need to be taught about monitoring for regular stools and ensure regular bowel movements. Appendicitis. This is an inflammation of the veriform appendix, typically from some type of obstruction in the appendiceal lumen. This can be due to a fecal lith, which is a hard fecal mass, intestinal parasites, anatomical defects, and even a low fiber diet. This occurs equally in boys and girls, average age is about 10, very rarely seen in children under two. Signs and symptoms. Typically you will have pain in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen at McBurney's point. This place is located halfway between the anterior suture anterior superior iliac crest and the umbilicus. Fever, rigid abdomen, decrease or absent bowel sounds, vomiting typically follows the onset of pain, constipation or diarrhea may be present, anorexia, tachycardia, rapid shallow breathing, pallor, lethargy, irritability, a stooped posture often due to the pain. If the pain suddenly stops, it most likely means the appendix has burst. Then signs and symptoms would be diffuse and increasing pain, abdominal distension, rapid shallow breathing, abdominal guarding, and a decrease in bowel sounds. Diagnosis is difficult. Cardinal signs is abrupt onset of abdominal pain, elevated white cell count greater than 10,000. C-reactive protein is positive or elevated. Uh, CT is a diagnostic stool tool of choice, and ultrasound is also often done. Approximately half of ad adolescents with appendicitis in one study did not look sick to the examiner, so you must be suspicious even if they don't look super sick. Treatment, remove the appendix before it perforates. More often than not, the surgery today will be a laparoscopic surgery. This typically has three small incisions. If this is not possible, they may do a regular incision in the McBurney's area. If you think a patient's appendix has, has appendicitis or you believe their appendix has ruptured, please place them on NPO status because they will be having surgery. Place them also in a semi fowler's position so the, the infected drainage from the cecum can drain downward into the pelvis rather than upwards towards the lungs. The patient will often also have an IV in place. They will be getting IV antibiotics. They may have a nasogastric tube in place if it was ruptured to low suction until the bowel sounds return. Typically antibiotics are between seven and 10 days. Often they will be getting ampicillin, gentamicin, flagyl, clindamycin. The wound may have a Penrose or a Jackson Pat drain. The wound may be left open if it was ruptured with uh, dressings or packing. The position should be with the head of the bed elevated uh, or on the right side to facilitate drainage. Typically, they will eat when the bowel sounds are present, starting with clear liquids, progressing as tolerated. Pain management usually is narcotics for the first few days. Uh, often IV meds are the first few days and then oral meds are afterwards. Incentive spirometer use 10 times an hour while awake is very important to prevent any lung issues. And we do want them to ambulate post-op day one. A couple of nursing considerations. Do not use a heating pad, laxatives, or enemas if you expect someone has appendicitis. 
This can increase inflammation and stimulate motility and therefore increase the risk of perforation. You can place ice on the abdomen to assist in pain management. Please refer to your care plan in your textbook. Crohn's disease. This is a chronic inflammatory bowel disease that can occur anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract. It most often occurs in the terminal ileum. Lesions are segmented and transmural, meaning that they can go through the mucosal wall. They may develop fistulas between the different loops of bowel or by near organs. Ulcers can grow in size and depth, and they can vary in severity. The cause is unknown, most often seen in Caucasian and people of Jewish descent anywhere between 15 and 25 years of age. And because it is a chronic problem, once it is diagnosed, it is a condition that the person has continuously lifelong. Signs and symptoms. Abdominal pain, cramps, diarrhea can be moderate to severe. They may have severe weight loss, fever, severe anorexia, rectal bleeding is uncommon, anal fissures or fistulas, significantly poor growth, mild rash, and joint pain are also, also often mild to moderate. There is a table in your textbook with these different signs and symptoms. Diagnosis, history and physical, elevated white blood cell count, elevated ESR with exacerbation, anemia, low total protein albumin, iron, zinc, magnesium, vitamin B12, and fat soluble vitamins, all may be low. The upper GI with a small bowel follow through to evaluate small bowel disease, an endoscopy with biopsy to determine extent and severity of the inflammatory process. There are a wide variety of treatments. Five amino salicylates are the first line treatment. They inhibit prostaglandin synthesis and they are active in the colon only. There are many examples. Mesalazine, osalazine, and balsalazide are preferred over sulfasalazine because they do have less side effects. In general, side effects include headache, nausea, vomiting, and neutropenia. These classification of medications does interfere with folic, absent, folic acid absorption. Therefore, it is very important that we give supplements. Corticosteroids may also be utilized, especially during exacerbations. Monitor for all the side effects that we can expect to see in corticosteroid use. Metronidazole, flagyl, is used adjunctively for Crohn's disease. Immune modulators, things like azathioprine and 6MP are used for kids who are steroid resistant. Side effects here, infection, pancreatitis, hepatitis, bone marrow toxicity, arthralgia, and malignancies. Biological therapies regulate the inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. TNF-alpha, Remicade, and Fliximab is used for severe disease resistant to other therapies. It is needed every eight weeks, and you may need to pre-medicate with prednisone or and Benadryl. Severe side effects include lupus-like syndrome, lymphoma, Less serious side effects include a stuffy nose, sinus pain, stomach pain, a mild rash, and or headache. Humira is approved for children over four years of age. TB and other opportunistic infections have been seen in people on Humira. Surgery. In general, surgery is used for obstruction or fistulas. It does not cure Crohn's disease. Nutrition. A high protein, high carbohydrate, high calorie diet, regular fat, small frequent meals. Definitely they need vitamin supplements, B complex, iron and zinc. If they are having issues with their nutrition, they may even need TPN and nasogastric tube feedings. 
We want to encourage socialization during meals because remember, meals are not just for nutrition, but they are often also part of our psychosocial well being. Must take the medications even if there are no signs and symptoms. It is these medications that keep them stable. Because of long term steroid use, there may be issues with growth retardation and sexual developmental delay. Weigh these patients daily. You want to avoid gas producing foods and fluids. Count the number of stools a day. Use antidiarrheals and antispasmodics as needed. They are at a high risk for bowel cancer. Therefore, regular screening for early detection is necessary. Parents need to learn central venous catheter line care if they are on TPN. Also, they need to learn to monitor for signs and symptoms of infection of a CDC, its malfunction, and how to determine if the patient is tolerating the TPN. If a patient is on a nasogastric tube feeding, parents also need to know how to manage and administer the nasogastric tube feeding. Parent, patients need peer support groups because of the changes in their appearance. They often are sick and in and out of school. Dietary restrictions and the inability to compete with peers can often cause them to have a need for a peer support group. Ulcerative colitis. This is also an inflammatory condition of the intestines. Uh, in general, it is of the colon and the rectum in the mucosa and the submucosa. Ulcerative colitis may be mild, moderate, or severe. Signs and symptoms, rectal bleeding, common with severe diarrhea, less frequently abdominal pain that worsens with defecation, anorexia is mild to moderate, weight loss, weight loss is moderate, a rash may be mild, mild to moderate joint pain, and the growth restriction in this condition is more mild than in Crohn's disease. Diagnosis, HMP, CBC, ESR, upper and lower GI, endoscopy confirms the inflammatory bowel disease. Medical treatment and nursing care is similar to Crohn's disease. The steroids, sulfasalazine, are often used. Less problems with growth failure. If medical and nutritional treatment are not sufficient, surgery with this condition is actually curative. A colectomy with a rectal mucosectomy and an endorectal ileoanal pull through and anastomosis can be performed. A pouch is created to help to increase continence after surgery. The benefits of surgery is that it does prevent cancer and the patient that has ulcerative colitis. This person's risk is the same as the rest of the population if they have surgery. If they do not have surgery, then they are at higher risk and require to have colonoscopies uh, much more frequently as the person with Crohn's disease. In general, people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis if they've not had surgery, should get colonoscopies with biopsies 10 years after diagnosis and then every one to two years unless the ulcerative colitis patient had corrective surgery as mentioned a moment ago. Cleft lip and cleft palate. Basically, this is a birth defect. It is an incomplete fusion of the lip or palate or both. It can be on one side or it can be bilateral. Folic acid at the time of conception decreases the risk by 25 to 50 percent. Therefore, any female that is having uh, intimate relations, it sh they should be taking some type of multivitamin that has 400 micrograms of folic acid in it in the event that they do conceive a child. Cleft lip. Typically, this is repaired about two to three months of age. Many doctors follow the rule of tens. If the infant is 10 weeks old, weighs 10 pounds, and has a hemoglobin of 10, they will do so. Remember, a cleft lip 
is literally just that it's an opening of the lip. It can be on one side or both sides. Once they have surgery, a Logan bow or other type of stabilizing dressing is used to prevent tension on the suture line. This surgery is typically done by a plastic surgeon and often afterwards, you can't even tell the patient had cleft lip. The child is medicated to decrease crying and elbow restraint, elbow restraints need to be maintained to prevent the child from touching the surgical site. Cleft palate. This is where the palate on the roof of the mouth is open. This is repaired at approximately six to 12 months of age, depending on the surgeon. This helps to protect the formation of tooth buds and promotes a more normal speech development. Before a cleft palate repair, the child must be weaned and taught to drink from a cup. Immediately after surgery, no straws, pacifiers, bottles, or metal utensils will be used after surgery for seven to 10 days. There will be no tooth brushing for one to two weeks. These children do have an increased issue with otitis media. Frequent otitis media can affect speech and hearing. Otitis media is caused by the poor middle ear drainage due to the inefficient functioning of the eustachian tube. Preoperatively, there is a risk for aspiration. So check the respiratory status, counting the respirations, assessing for rate, depth, rhythm, and effort, listening to lung sounds, vital signs, feeding them solely and meeting their sucking needs, using adaptive devices. If they have a cleft lip, you can use a Nook or Playtex nurser. Cleft palates require special feeding. Uh, they can use a pigeon bottle, a Mead Johnson cleft palate nurser. A syringe may also be used if these are not successful. You wanna position the child upright when they are feeding and burp them very, very frequently every 15 to 30 milliliters. Keep mate section equipment at the bedtime, at the bedside in the event of aspiration. Altered nutrition can also be a problem. You want to assess the fluid and the calorie intake daily, weigh the child daily. They want to be given anywhere between 100 and 150 kilocalories per kilogram a day and 100 to 130 milliliters per kilogram a day of fluid. They may breastfeed in a semi-sitting position initially, a letting, letting the letdown reflex prior to nursing. The nurse can assist with this by applying a warm cloth to the breast before feeding and plugging the cleft lip. The lip often molds to the breast, making it so that a child with cleft lip can breastfeed. If they are not successful, you can pump the breast milk and then bottle feed or feed in the way that will be successful for the child. Also calling La Leche League for assistance can definitely be beneficial. Most hospitals have a breastfeeding expert on hand to aid for this situation. They may need to do nasogastric tube feedings if they are unable to maintain nutrition. There is an acronym called ESSR. Unfortunately, this is not in your book, but I do want you to know this. Um, this is how we feed. Uh, these children. You may be enlarging the nipple. Often they might cross cut the nipple a little bit just so the fluid can flow a little bit more easily. You want to stimulate the mouth and that may be by twirling the nipple and you may even support the chin with your finger. Giving them time to swallow and allowing them to rest. Feeding these children requires a great deal of patience and you must be watching them as you are feeding them. Postoperatively, checking for ineffective breathing, checking for the vital signs, watching that respiratory pattern, keeping suction at the bedside. They may actually be in a cool mist tent for the first 24 hours. Impaired tissue integrity. For a child who had a cleft lip repair, position them on their 
backs. We do not want them rubbing their lips on the sheet. If a child had a cleft palate repair, position them on their stomach initially. We would like the drainage from the palate to fall out of the mouth and we don't want them to aspirate it. Then once they are wide awake, then you may be positioning them more upright. Both require elbow restraints. Do not use metal utensils or straws. Keep them well medicated for pain. We do want the parents to hold and comfort the child. If the parent is holding the child and is very careful, periodically they may remove the elbow restraints. These elbow restraints may only be removed if the parent or caregiver is holding the child's arm so their hand will not go to their mouth. Please let the child play with appropriate toys. As with all surgeries, there is a risk for infection. So in a couple of days, begin monitoring for that. Monitor for signs and symptoms infection. Daily clean the suture line. Typically this is done multiple times a day with uh, normal saline and antibiotic ointment may be ordered or uh, petrolatum, uh, petroleum jelly may be applied for seven to 10 days to aid with healing. Nutrition, feeding with a dropper or an aseptic syringe, uh, giving a high calorie diet. And once approved, they may actually be given soft foods. The knowledge deficit, parents need to be taught all home care feeding and restrictions and positioning prior to discharge. They also need to be taught the medications that they may be taking for pain management, as well as follow-up care. Esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula. This is a birth defect, and what happens here is the proximal esophageal segment basically ends in a blind pouch. The distal segment is connected to the trachea or the primary bronchus by a short fistula at or near the bifurcation. Approximately 50% of the cases of EA slash TEF are a component of VATER or VACTERL association. These acronyms are used to describe uh, associated anomalies. This is a surgical emergency. Basically, there is a bridge connecting the trachea to the esophagus, and it's the lower portion of the esophagus. Therefore, there can be an issue with stomach contents going up the esophagus, across the little fistula, and then eventually that content can go into the lungs. This is why this is a surgical emergency. Signs and symptoms, excessive salivation and drooling. The reason that's the case is because the top portion of the esophagus ends in a blind pouch. Therefore, the mouth is salivating, as we all do, but there is no place for it to go. The three C's of TEF, coughing, choking, and cyanosis. Apnea is another problem, increased respiratory distress after feeding, and abdominal distension. Preoperatively, the esophagus, esophageal atresia will have a tube in place and it will be placed to suction continuously. They will be supine with the head of the bed elevated at least 30 degrees. They will be on an IV antibiotics and fluids. Definitely they are NPO and we want to prevent aspiration. Treatment. The first surgery, they will be cutting the, vis the fistula and they will create a gastrostomy tube for feeding. They will be getting IV antibiotics, fluids, and possibly TPN. 
second surgery, they will reanastomose the two ends of the esophagus, generally starting gastrostomy tubes within five to seven days. If this is tolerated, then they can start oral feedings 10 to 14 days later. Oral feeding is begun very carefully with sterile water, and we want to observe for any signs and symptoms of choking or airway obstruction. You would see this if they had an anxious expression or tachypnea. Postoperative care is the same as any other surgery with the exception of the above information regarding the gastrostomy tube as well as the feeding. Follow-up, parents need to be taught how to manage the gastrostomy tube, the tube site, and the feeding. Nurses need to monitor for signs and symptoms of infection. We also need to monitor and teach the parents to monitor for signs and symptoms of GERD as well as aspiration. Hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. This is an obstruction of the circular muscle of the pyloric canal. Remember that is the little muscle that is on the end of the stomach. The circular muscle of the pylorus becomes thickened, causing constriction of the pylorus and obstruction of the gastric outlet. Typically, this develops between two and four weeks of age. Signs and symptoms, initially they are a good either. As the obstruction progresses, they may projectile vomit, three to four feet in distance. They're very irritable. They have failure to thrive, weight loss, dehydration. And interestingly enough, after vomiting, they are crying because they are hungry and they will eat again after vomiting. Diagnosis. You can see peristaltic waves across the abdomen going from left to right. There is an olive-sized mass on the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. An ultrasound will show an elongated sausage-shaped mass with an elongated pyloric channel and an upper GI series to rule out other causes of the vomiting. Preoperatively, they will be NPO and they will have a nasal gastric tube to intermittent suction. The treatment is surgery. They will do a laparoscopic pyloromyotomy, also known as a Fredet. Ramstead procedure to release circular muscle fibers so that food and fluids can pass. Basically what they do is they cut the pyloric muscle, not all the way through, partially through, all the way around to loosen the muscle fibers. Postoperatively, of course, always monitoring the vital signs and for signs and symptoms of hemorrhage. IV fluids will be given, monitoring for bowel sounds, strict INO, monitor for weight loss, after three days monitor for signs and symptoms of infection. Usually feeding begins quite rapidly once bowel sounds are present, starting with clear liquids within the first four to six hours. The doctor will then give a very specific progression of food and fluids amounts. So they may start with five milliliters of breast milk, if they tolerate that, they will then get 10 milliliters of breast milk two hours later. If they tolerate that two hours later, they may get 15 milliliters of breast milk. And they will continue on that progression until they are tolerating full feedings. Know that because this patient has been vomiting frequently, they may have some intermittent vomiting 24 to 48 hours after surgery. In general, patients are discharged within the first three days. Intussusception. This is where one portion of the intestine telescopes into an other, typically beginning at the ileocecal valve into the cecum and colon. This occurs more in boys and girls, usually between five months and three years of age. It is most common under two years old. Classic signs and symptoms is an abrupt onset of vomiting, palpable abdominal mass, crying in a severe colicky abdominal pain, sudden drawing up of the legs. Again, this is due to that severe chronic uh, colicky abdominal pain. Uh, often the legs will draw up and crying will repeat every 20 minutes. So it is 
It can be an intermittent pain. And they will have a current jelly-like stool. So it's sort of like a very dark, burgundy, blackish color stools. Chronic issues would be signs and symptoms of diarrhea, anorexia, occasional vomiting and pain. The diagnosis is based on the history and ultrasound. In most cases, the initial treatment of choice is non-surgical radiologist guided pneumo enema, air enema with or without water soluble contrast and or ultrasound guided hydrostatic enema with saline. The nurse should monitor for passage of brown stool. This indicates the intussusception has reduced itself and you should call the practitioner. This is good news. If surgery is indicated, the intestines will be reduced. And if there is any necrotic tissue, this will be removed at that time. Postoperatively, again, monitoring vital signs, signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, monitoring for bowel sounds, checking the abdomen for distension. They may have a nasogastric tube to intermittent suction. And then a few days later, monitoring for infection. Again, we will start with clear liquids and progress to full feedings as tolerated. Anal rectal malformations. This can encompass several forms of deformities without an obvious anal opening. They may have a fistula from the distal rectum to the perineum or even into the genitourinary system. Diagnosis, this is where there is an absence of an anus or rectal patency. There is no meconium in the first 24 hours. You might actually see stool coming out where the child is voiding from, so from the urethra. You might see ribbon-like stools. An ultrasound and or lower GI series will confirm the extent of the problem. Treatment, reconstructive surgery. Typically, this is done after a temporary colostomy. Nursing, you want to observe on all of your newborns for meconium stool. Preoperatively, IV fluids, nasogastric tubes, strict INO, obviously no rectal temperatures. You want to give parents the information regarding surgery. Postoperatively, vital signs, hemorrhage assessment, pain management, wound care, monitoring bowel sounds, position, side lying with the hips elevated or supine with the legs suspended at a 90 angle, 90 degree angle to the trunk helps to decrease pressure on the suture line. A few days later, again, monitoring for signs and symptoms of infection. Once they are stable with the bowel sounds, clear liquids can progress to a full liquid and a full regular diet. You wanna teach the family, again, about colostomy care and maintaining meticulous skin care. Continence may not be achieved at two to three years of age, if ever. They may need daily bowel irrigations and they may need support and reassurance. Again, families need to be taught how to do the bowel irrigations. Celiac disease. This is a gluten-induced enteropathy. It is a disease of the proximal intestine characterized by abnormal mucosa and permanent intolerance to gluten. This is something that can, you can either be born with or sometimes people develop this later on. This is the second most common malabsorption problem in children. Cystic fibrosis is the first one. When the patient eats wheat, barley, rye, and oats containing foods, the gliadin part of the gluten is not digested, resulting in an accumulation of a toxic substance that damages the mucosal cells. GI changes cause malabsorption of protein, carbohydrates, calcium, iron, folate, and all of your fat-soluble vitamins, which are vitamin A, D, E, and K, and then also issues with B12. Oats actually don't naturally contain gliadin, but because of the way they are manufactured, that is why they are on this list. So unless oats are designated as gluten-free, they should not have 
oat containing foods. Signs and symptoms. Typically they appear about one to five years of age. They have impaired fat absorption and therefore their stools will reflect that with stetcheria, which is excessively large, pale, oily, frothy stools, very foul smelling stools. The impaired absorption of nutrients will show malnutrition, muscle wasting, especially on the legs and the buttocks. Exceedingly foul smelling stools. Oh, that was already mentioned, sorry. Anemia, anorexia, abdominal distension, behavioral changes like irritability, fretfulness, uncooperativeness, and apathy. If they go into a celiac crisis, here you can see acute severe episode of profuse watery diarrhea and vomiting. This can be caused by infections, especially gastrointestinal. Additional things you can see would be prolonged fluid and electrolyte depletion and emotional disturbance. If there is a late diagnosis, because this can impact vitamin D and calcium, they can have issues with dentition and bone density. Diagnosis. The blood test is for transglutaminase and anti-endomysial antibodies in children over 18 months. A biopsy of the small intestine shows mucosal inflammatory changes fecal fat content, and full clinical remission after gluten withdrawal from the diet. Children with untreated celiac disease may have lactose intolerance, but this usually resolves after treatment. Treatment is to eliminate all gluten-containing foods. It's very important for families to be taught to read all the labels. Many cereals, baked goods, processed ice creams, lunch meats, hot dogs, gravy, prepared soups, hamburgers, and even some chocolate candies may have gluten in it. Substitutions such as coarse, corn, rice, and millet can be used. Many cookbooks are sold to aid patients and parents that have a child with a gluten intolerance. Prognosis. Signs and symptoms improve greatly within a few days to a few weeks when they have a low to no gluten diet. It can be very difficult to have an absolute no gluten diet, but we do our best to get there. The mucosa is typically better after six months of treatment. The most serious complication of this disease is getting lymphoma if you are non-compliant. In general, kids are healthy and symptom-free if they are compliant. Failure to thrive or growth failure is a sign of inadequate growth resulting from an inability to obtain or use calories required for growth. Approximately 5 to 10 percent of children in primary care in the United States have failure to thrive with the majority presenting before 18 months of age. Classifications of organic and non-organic failure to thrive are too simplistic because most cases of growth failure have mixed causes. Failure to thrive is classified by pathology in three ways. Number one, inadequate calorie intake. Therefore, they may have incorrect formula preparation, neglect, food fads, lack of food availability, breastfeeding problems, behavioral problems affecting eating, or central nervous system problems affecting intake. Number two, inadequate calorie absorption, food allergies, malabsorptions, pyloric stenosis, GI atresia, or inborn errors of metabolism can fall into this category. Number three, excessive calorie expenditure. Conditions like hyperthyroidism, malignancy, congenital heart disease, chronic pulmonary disease, or chronic immunodeficiency would be in this classification. Previous classification of organic or non-organic, as said before, are too simplistic. Growth failure or failure to thrive 
may occur in children who have a chronic illness or in a family environment while healthy eating infant feeding practices are poorly managed or understood. Sometimes growth failure is not always associated with a pattern of disturbed maternal infant relationship. The primary management is aimed at reversing the cause of growth failure. Therefore, assessment of the child and family and environment is crucial. The goal is to provide sufficient calories to support catch-up growth at a rate of growth greater than the expected rate of age. Nursing care. Provide a positive feeding environment, teaching parents successful feeding strategies, supporting the child and family. Essential components of nursing care are accurate assessment of initial weight, height, and daily weight, and all food intake is mandatory. Documenting the child's feeding behavior, as well as the parent-child interaction during feeding can aid in success. The next area we will discuss has to do with our genital urinary system, our urinary tract. So the first condition we will talk about here is urinary tract infections. They may involve the lower or upper urinary tract. Infections confined to the lower urinary tract, such as cystitis or an inflammation of the urinary bladder, or urethritis, inflammation of the urethra, may be followed by recurrent episodes without long-term problems. Infections of the upper urinary tract, like pyelonephritis and a ureteritis, can actually cause permanent renal damage or scarring. Uncircumcised males under three months of age actually had the highest prevalence, 20.1%. After this, it more common in girls than boys with a peak age between two and six years of age, unless there is a structural abnormality. 80% are caused by E. coli. Signs and symptoms, infants, they can have fever, weight loss, failure to thrive, vomiting, increased voiding, foul smelling urine, and a persistent diaper rash. Children often will complain of urinary frequency, pain during urination, an onset of bedwetting in a previously dry trial, abdominal pain, hematuria, fever, chills, and flank pain are often seen in a child with a pyelonephritis. Diagnosis, a positive urine culture. The most accurate of bacterial content are suprapubic, under two years of age, and bladder catheterization. You wanna discard the first few milliliters of urine when you are doing this. VCUGs, voiding sister urethrograms, can determine if there is an abnormal backflow or retrograde flow of the bladder urine into the ureters. Um, if there is an issue with hydronephrosis, meaning that the urine is going backwards, it shouldn't be, by the way, um, that can actually cause issues with recurrent pyelonephritis. Know that when someone is going to have a VCUG, done, they need to have a catheter in place prior to going for the exam. Please make sure when the doctor writes orders for this exam that there is also an order for a catheter to be in place. IVPs and ultrasounds may also be done. Treatment, oral or IV antibiotics. If a defect is present, they may need to be needed to prevent further infection and prevent problems with kidney scarring. As a nurse, we know there are many predisposing factors that can help to cause or increase the risk of people getting urinary tract infections. So next we will list things that can help cause inf infections as well as how we can prevent them. So number one, the female has a short urethra close to the vagina and anus. How can we prevent? Perineal hygiene, wiping front to back, avoid tight clothing and diapers, wearing cotton underwear versus nylons. Check for vaginitis or pinworms, especially if the child is scratching between their legs. Avoid hot tubs, whirlpool baths, 
water softeners, bubble baths, or bath oils. Recommend frequent pad changing for girls who are menstruating. A problem of incomplete emptying of an over distension of the bladder. Here we can avoid holding the urine, encouraging the child to avoid frequently, especially before long trips or other circumstances where toileting facilities may not be available. We want them to empty their bladder completely with each void. You may have them double void, which is basically voiding and then waiting a few moments and then having them try to void again. Severe cases may require clean intermittent catheterization or biofeedback. We want to avoid straining during defecation and avoid issues with constipation to prevent that incomplete emptying and over distension of the bladder. Concentrated urine. Methods to prevent this is generous fluid intake. Drinking apple or cranberry juice to maintain the acidity of the urine also can be beneficial. Acidifying the urine decreases the rate of bacterial multiplication. An acid ash diet consists of meat, cheese, crudes, cranberries, plums, and whole grains also can be beneficial. Remember, the American Academy of Pediatrics does not recommend routine circumcision. You want to treat bladder spasms with warm compresses unless a fever is present initially. And we want to avoid, uh, we want to assess the patient's voiding patterns. Hypospadias. Here, this is a birth defect where the urethral opening is on the ventral or the underside of the penis. This is diagnosed at birth. We do not circumcise because you may need the foreskin for corrective surgery. Epispadias is when the urethral opening is on the up top side of the penis. Treatment. Here, you may apply testosterone to enlarge the penis so surgery is easier. Just FYI, I think I forgot to mention this, do not circumcise because you may need the foreskin during corrective surgery. Know that when you apply testosterone cream to uh, make it so that the penis does enlarge so surgery is easier, pubic hair may develop but it will disappear and the penis size will return to normal once the cream is soft. Surgically repaired tip, uh, typically occurs between six and 18 months of age. So this helps to facilitate the child being able to urinate in a straight stream in a standing position. And if they have a cordae, uh, which is a fibrous band under the penis causing it to curve, uh, they will typically fix that as well. Um, and that helps to straighten the penis and uh, helps it for future sexual functioning. Nursing, you want to check vital signs, strict INO, a urinary stent or often a catheter will be present after surgery. Um, they will often have restraint, uh, restraints because we don't want them pulling on the stent or the catheter. Pain medications, obviously, because they've had surgery. Muscle relaxants may be given. Uh, things like uh, ditropan, uh, which is oxybutynin, may be prescribed for those bladder spasms. Antibiotics will be given until uh, the catheter is removed or the stent, if that is used, falls out. You want to avoid a straddling position for two weeks. Uh, one technique to help decrease issues with stool getting on the stent is you will use a double diaper technique. There, you will cut one diaper through the middle and the stent can be put through that hole and that goes close to the patient. And a second diaper is covering the stent, the first diaper to collect the urine. Know that urine will be bloody for a few days. Monitor for signs and symptoms of infection. Usually the child is discharged in a couple of days. So please make sure that the parent is given all of the above discharge instructions as well as the medication instructions and the, the necessity of the restraints. Cryptorchidism. One or both testes fail to descend 
from the inguinal canal into the scrotum. This usually occurs between seven and nine months of gestation. 75% of cases will spontaneously descend by nine to 12 months. If they don't, they may be given human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. If the testes still do not distend, then an orchiopexy may be performed between in one and two years of age. In general, we want to avoid a total dose of more than 15,000 international units of HCG because it can actually cause an epiphyseal growth plate fusion resulting in growth retardation. Some side effects include increased body hair growth and large penis and darkened scrotal pigment. Surgery is done on an outpatient basis. Postoperatively apply ice to the area, pain management, check for signs and symptoms of infection in a couple of days, and then again, restrict activity for two weeks, again, avoiding that straddling position. When assessing a child, place him in a warm room because a cold room will draw the testicles closer to the body. And remember, they will be placed in Turner's position. Parents are very anxious because they are fearful because their child may have decreased fertility. Know that these patients have an increased risk for testicular cancer and decreased fertility. Nephrotic syndrome. 80% have a primary disease called minimal change nephrotic syndrome, most common in two to seven year olds, twice as often in boys and girls. For a nonspecific cause, the glomerulus is damaged. This damage causes an increased permeability of the glomerular membrane that allows albumin to pass into the urine. Basically, you are peeing out your protein. Kidneys reabsorb salt and water. Protein deficiency leads to a decrease in osmotic pressure, allowing the fluids to escape into tissues. Massive edema resulting. I'm sure many of you have heard the term third spacing. This is what it is. A loss of protein leads to decreased immunoglobulins, and it is that decrease in immunoglobulins that can increase their susceptibility to infections. Signs and symptoms weight gain, puffiness of the face, especially around the eyes and when they wake up in the morning, and it typically decreases throughout the day. They can have abdominal swelling, ascites, pleural effusion, labial or scrotal swelling, edema or intestinal mucosa may cause diarrhea, anorexia, poor intestinal absorption, ankle and leg swelling, irritability, they're very easily fatigued. They are lethargic, blood pressure normal or slightly decreased. They have an increased susceptibility to infections. The urine alterations, basically it's a decrease in volume, very frothy. Diagnosis, history and physical, low albumin levels in the blood, protein in the urine greater than plus two, and also hypercholesterolemia, so high fat in the blood. Treatment, prednisone, which does cause diuresis in children, exactly the mechanism is unknown, daily for six weeks and then alternate day doses for six weeks. They may be also given 25% albumin IV. Diuretics may be used for edema. Relapses may occur when the child gets their immunizations, if they have allergies, or if they develop an infection. Relapses typically do not occur after puberty. Nursing, what do we need to do? Vital signs, checking and taking output, abdominal circumference for ascites, assessing the urine for specific gravity and urine protein by doing urine dipsticks, giving the prednisone as ordered and monitor for side effects such as moon face, increased weight, increased hair growth, mood swings, elevated glucose, elevated sodium, decreased potassium, elevated blood pressure, and growth retardation long-term. Prevent infection and skin breakdown. The patient may need to be turned every two hours. The child should be on a low sodium fluid restricted and regular protein diet. Remember, they are peeing out their protein. 
teach the parents medication regime to monitor the weight every single day using the same scale with the same clothing on at the same time of the day. Checking the abdominal circumference, checking urine dipsticks, and to call the doctor if the urine dipstick is plus two for protein, which can indicate a relapse. Hold the immunizations until prednisone is completed. Acute glomerular nephritis, also called acute post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. The child develops a streptococcal infection. They then get better, and then 10 to 21 days later, the child develops this condition because an immune response, antigen antibody complexes, are deposited into the glomerular basement membrane, causing inflammation and obstruction. The peak age for this is six to seven years of age, again, twice as often in boys than girls. Diagnosis, hematuria and proteinuria, plus three and plus four. Elevated BUN, elevated creatinine, T-colored urine, elevated white blood cell count. An elevated antistreptolysin O titer shows a previous strep infection. Renal ultrasounds may be done. Make sure you know your normal labs for the test, like your BUN, normal is four to 18 milligrams per deciliter. Infant and child is five to 18 milligrams per deciliter. Your uric acid, two to 5.5 milligrams per deciliter. Creatinine in an infant is 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 milligrams per deciliter. A child is 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 milligrams per deciliter. And an adolescent is 0 0.5 to one milligrams per deciliter. Signs and symptoms, edema, especially periorbital. Facial edema, more prominent in the morning and spreads throughout the day to involve extremities and the abdomen. The urine is a cloudy, smoky brown, resembles tea or Coca-Cola, severely reduced, reduced in volume. They may have a very poor appetite, pallor, irritability, lethargy. This patient looks very ill. They seldom express very specific complaints. They may have vomiting. They may have mildly or moderately elevated blood pressure. Older children may have issues with headaches, abdominal discomfort, and dysuria. Treatment is bed rest, antihypertensive medications if necessary, di possibly diuretics, fluid and sodium restriction, low potassium and protein if the BUN is elevated, small frequent meals. Recovery takes a few weeks. Nursing monitoring vital signs, weights every day. Remember, that is the best way to determine weight gain or weight loss. Strict INO, edema monitoring, monitoring the abdominal girth, making sure the output is at least one milliliter per kilogram an hour, maintaining skin care due to bed rest and edema. Quiet activity should occur until they are better and then slowly increase the activity as tolerated. Prevent infection due to a decrease in renal functioning, uh, resulting in increased risks. Check specific gravity, as well as monitor for signs and symptoms of infection, elevated temperature, malaise, elevated blood count. Teach patient parents the medications, side effects, diet, how to do the urine dipsticks, blood pressure monitoring, and signs and symptoms to call the medical physician. A relapse may be occurring if the dipstick is plus two for protein for more than three days, or if the child is found to have a plus three or plus four plus edema on any one day. Complications include peritonitis, cellulitis, pneumonia, circulatory insufficiency due to hypovolemia and thromboembolism. Fluid volume excess is related to a decrease in plasma filtration, a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. As they improve, urine output will increase, thus decreasing their weight. This concludes the lecture addressing the behavioral objectives for week five. Please be sure to read your textbook and complete the assignments for this week to facilitate utilizing the content and applying this content to nursing practice. 
Thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye.